Order, please. <coughs> Order, please. We'll now begin with the daily routine, beginning with presenting and reading of petitions. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to table a, pe a petition, the operative clause being, we, the concerned citizens of the Marguerites, are requesting the, that the Department of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal make an immediate assessment and repairs to Egypt Road in Marguerite Valley. This petition has 90 signatures, and I have affixed my own as per the rules of this House. Petition is tabled. Presenting reports of committees. Tabling reports, regulations, and other papers. Statements by ministers. Government notices of motion. The Honourable Deputy Premier, on behalf of the Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do make this motion on behalf of the Premier, Premier Stephen McNeil, Minister of Aboriginal Affairs. And, no, thank you. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas Orange Shirt Day began in 2013 in recognition of residential school survivor Phyllis Jack Webstead's experience as a six-year-old child arriving at residential school for the first time and having her new orange shirt taken away from her. And whereas wearing an orange shirt and promoting the slogan, Every Child Matters, is an affirmation of our commitment to raise awareness of the residential school experience and come together in the spirit of reconciliation and hope for generations to come. And whereas Orange Shirt Day is held annually on September 30th, a day chosen to reflect the time of year in which Indigenous children across Canada were taken from their homes to residential schools. Therefore, be it resolved that members of this House of Assembly and all Nova Scotians join students from across the province in recognizing Orange Shirt Day on September 30th. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye? aye. Contrary minded, nay. Motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas the impacts of climate change are creating a global emergency. And whereas today students throughout Nova Scotia and beyond are participating in a walkout to bring attention to climate change, and whereas these students are showing that young people are engaged and motivated to play their part in ensuring a healthy and safe future for our planet and for all people, therefore be it resolved that all members of this legislature join me in thanking our students for their leadership on this important issue and for being inspirations to us all. I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I will move the adoption of the following motion. Whereas Climate Action Week has prompted millions of people around the world to draw attention to this urgent global crisis, and whereas its effects, including droughts and floods, Stronger storms, milder winters, and long summer heat waves are already being felt here in Nova Scotia. And whereas Nova Scotians have worked hard to increase renewable energy, reduce emissions, and prepare for the impact of climate change, but there is still much more to do. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House thank all those who came here today to remind us of the urgency of this issue and promise to do our part to fight climate change. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I make an introduction? Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to draw my colleagues' attention to the uh, East Gallery, where we have some uh, special guests, and I'd ask uh, that the guests uh, please rise as they introduce them so they can be recognized uh, by the uh, House. Uh, uh, Nazim, uh, sorry, yeah, Nazim Farah, who's a primary care paramedic. Uh, <laughs> Luke Slies who's an, also an advanced care paramedic. Sarah Boudreau, who's an advanced care paramedic and part of the extended care paramedic program. And uh, Sarah's joined by her daughter, 
uh, Sophie. <laughs> And we also have Savannah Rahe, uh, primary care paramedic. So I guess they already received the warm welcome of the house. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day, I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas every day, paramedics work on the front lines of the health care system, directly providing care and comfort to Nova Scotians in need. And whereas, Across the country, and certainly in Nova Scotia, the paramedic profession continues to be at the forefront of innovation. And whereas September 30th, Medic Monday, is a time to thank Nova Scotia's highly skilled and dedicated paramedics who respond to Nova Scotians in the time of their greatest needs. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House thank the more than 1,200 paramedics for their dedication and service to communities in every corner of the province. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded nay. The motion is carried. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Communities, Culture and Heritage. I hereby give notice on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas September 21st to September 29th marks National Coaches Week, which is an opportunity to thank our coaches from across the country and celebrate the important impact they have on the lives of the athletes they coach. And whereas Nova Scotia is home to over 10,500 extremely influential coaches on community and professional levels, many of whom put in hundreds of volunteer hours with the goal of helping our athletes achieve their dreams. And whereas over 6,000 NCCP coaching courses and modules were delivered in Nova Scotia last year, and our government invests 1.3 million annually in supporting provincial sport organizations, as we know a robust sports sector improves the quality of life of Nova Scotians and provides social and economic benefits to all communities. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly thank the hardworking coaches across our province who make a lasting difference in the lives of our athletes. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and pass each without debate. There has been a request for waivers. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. May I make another introduction? Permission granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. If I uh, direct my colleague's attention again to the East Gallery, I'd like to introduce Joan Mitchell, who's the Executive Director for the Atlantic Region of the Arthritis Society. Please uh, give her the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas one in four Nova Scotians live with the painful impact of arthritis, and whereas the Arthritis Society promotes public awareness and help to those living with arthritis and supports research to find a cure for this debilitating disease, and whereas September is Arthritis Awareness Month, a time to focus on ways to improve the quality of life for Nova Scotians living with arthritis. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the House of Assembly join me in congratulating the Arthritis Society for their advocacy and support for Nova Scotians living with arthritis. Mr. Speaker, I ask for waiver of notice and passage without mm -hmm. debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, in the East Gallery, we're joined today by two special guests. We have Kathy Hay, President and CEO of Kids Help Phone, and Don Boylan, currently Senior Manager of Community Investment at Bell Alliant and a founding partner of Kids Help Phone. Kathy strives to provide a safe and trusted place for young people in, in their moment of crisis and need. And Good to Talk Post-Secondary Student Helpline is one of the four e-mental health tools, labour and advanced education funds that provide services and access points into mental health care on our campuses. It's delivered by Kids Help Phone and Good to Talk is a free confidential helpline providing professional counselling, information and referral, referrals for mental health, addictions, well-being to post-secondary students in Nova Scotia 24 hours a day, every day of the year. I'd like to ask Kathy and Don to stand and receive the warm welcome of the House. I 
notes that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas it is important that post-secondary students have access to mental health services and supports, and whereas Kids Help Phone is recognized as a pioneer in e-mental health and virtual care and is dedicated to amplifying the voice of young people and opening doors and creating an environment where women are encouraged to grow, succeed, and feel comfortable to pursue any career they so choose, contributing to an inclusive and resilient province. And whereas by calling Good to Talk, Nova Scotia <coughs> students can receive support from professional counsellors on a wide range of stresses and concerns that can impact their mental health well-being and success during post-secondary studies. Therefore, be resolved that all members of this legislature acknowledge the hard work of our mental health professionals and their commitment to fostering an understanding and supportive environment for you. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver and of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed, but all those in favour of the motion, please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, whereas 2019 commemorates 150 years since the first British home children were brought to Canada, and whereas between 1869 and 1948, over 120,000 British home children, some as young as four years old, were brought from England to the Dominion of Canada to work as indentured laborers or domestic servants enduring separation from family, hardship, and uncertainty of their future, and that many of these migrant children, workers, who came to Nova Scotia, grew up, settled here, and with strong tenacity, they and their descendants have contributed greatly to the growth and prosperity of our province of Nova Scotia. And whereas the Nova Scotia Legislative Assembly will, will recognize this important milestone by being lit on the evening of September 28th, and participating in the Canada-wide Beacons of Light program. Therefore, be it resolved that in recognition of these British home children and the many Nova Scotians who proudly carry this ancestry, that September 28, 2019 be declared British Home Child Day by the Government of Nova Scotia. I hereby uh, ask for a waiver. Thank you. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed? It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of African Nova Scotian Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas George Frederick Parsons, who was born on July 25, 1847 in Amherst, had the gift for producing beautiful grounds, lawns, landscapes, and engineered structures starting at an early age. And whereas Mr. Parsons spent his lifetime building various structures in Amherst, which included carving headstones in the first town cemetery, repairing the stone reservoir, and dam, constructing Dickey Park, Curry Park, Victoria Square, and producing the first snow fences along the Intercolonial Railway of Canada. And whereas Mr. Parsons was appointed to the role as the first streets superintendent of Amherst, where he built multiple streets, homes, and structures that are still present in the town today. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the House of Assembly join me in recognizing the life of George Frederick Parsons and acknowledging the fundamental role he played in building the town of Amherst. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The Honourable Minister of Energy and Mines. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas climate change is an urgent and global issue that threatens our environment, our economy, and our province's future well-being and prosperity, 
And whereas Nova Scotia has become a North American leader in fighting climate change by reducing emissions more than 30 percent below 2005 levels, meeting the federal emission reduction target 13 years early, and tripling the amount of renewable electricity in our system, and whereas we will continue to build on those successes by investing almost $120 million over the next four years on solar programs, energy efficiency projects, clean transportation options, and other ideas that reduce emissions and create green jobs across the province. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of the Legislature recognize September 26, 2019 as a day of action on climate change and commit to working together with all Nova Scotians to reach our climate change goals. Mr. Speaker, I ask for a waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary-minded, nay. Motion is carried. The Honourable Member for Yarmouth on an introduction. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to bring the members of the House attention to the West, Gal or the, yeah, West Gallery, um, where seated here is one of my uh, dearest friends from Yarmouth, my favourite Tory from Yarmouth, uh, <laughs> Joyce Nickerson, uh, who is uh, celebrating her 87th birthday today. I, I hope the House can join me in welcoming her and wishing her a happy birthday. Minister of Lands and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I hereby give notice that on a future day I shall move the adoption of the following resolution. Whereas climate change and biodiversity loss pose an existential threat that affects us all, and whereas Nova Scotia's forests play a vital role in how carbon is sequestered in the, our atmosphere, and whereas Nova Scotia is adopting ecological forestry to better manage our forests with long term environmental objectives at the forefront. Therefore, be it resolved that all members of this House work together across party lines to move our province forward to address climate change and the global emergency that it is. Mr. Speaker, I request waiver of notice and passage without debate. There has been a request for waiver. Is it agreed? agreed. It is agreed. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. aye. Contrary minded, nay. The motion is carried. We'll now move on to introduction of bills. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to introduce a bill, an act to amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 1996, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Aquaculture begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 1996, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. Bill number 160, entitled An Act to Amend Chapter 25 of the Acts of 1996, the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices. Oh. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I beg leave to introduce a bill, uh, an act respecting a declaration of climate emergency. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act Respecting a Declaration of Climate Emergency. Bill number 161, entitled An Act Respecting a Declaration of Climate Emergency. Ordered that the bill be read a second time on a future day. <laughs> the Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education CSAP Act. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party begs leave to introduce a bill entitled An Act to Amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education CSAP Act. 
Bill number 162 entitled an act to amend Schedule A of Chapter 1 of the Acts of 2018, the Education Act, and Chapter 1 of the Acts of 1995-96, the Education CSAP Act. Ordered that this bill be read a second time on a future day. We'll now move on to notices of motion. Statements by members. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to congratulate one of Cumberland North's newest entrepreneurs. Dwayne Ripley has opened a new business in Amherst called Curly Sports and Supplements in Dale's Grand Market. Dwayne was able to start his own business this summer with help from local CBDC programs. Dwayne has taken his passions and put them into a business that he can both enjoy and work hard at. Dwayne has a drive to succeed and has put hard work into reaching this point. I would like to welcome Curly's Sports and Supplements as one of our new local businesses and wish Dwayne Ripley great success as he begins and grows his business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland South. Oh, pardon me, Dartmouth South. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today, as hundreds of thousands of people around the world take to the streets, I rise to draw attention to the ways in which the impacts of climate change are already being felt in my constituency of Dartmouth South. Dartmouth has long been known as the City of Lakes, and even 20 years after amalgamation, that is firmly how we see ourselves. But our lakes are under threat, Mr. Speaker. Rapid weed growth, harmful blue-green algae blooms, phosphorus loading, and invasive species are some of the many challenges facing Dartmouth. Some of these are exacerbated by human and industrial activities, but they are turbocharged by climate change. While some of the impacts of global warming can seem abstract to those of us lucky enough not to be affected yet, the impacts of our lakes have a profound effect on our community. Swimming beaches and low-income communities closed, hundreds of children unable to experience the natural gems of their own community, and profound risks to the world-class paddling competitions that take place on our lakes every summer. I'd like to recognize the many individuals and groups working to mitigate these impacts and plan for the future and to reaffirm my own commitment to save our lakes. The Honourable Member for Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Thank you kindly, Mr. Speaker. Certainly, I'll join the voices of my colleagues and recognize that climate change affects every single person in our province, especially our youth. Polling consistently shows that young people place climate change among their top issues. The science behind this issue is settled, Mr. Speaker, and the time for climate denial is over. The time for action, Mr. Speaker, is now. I'm happy to be part of a government that is committed to combat climate change and fight for future generations. When we look back at our time in government, I hope that uh, our commitment to climate change is among the things that we are remembered for. Under the leadership of our government, Nova Scotia is projected to have 40% of its energy from renewable sources by next year. This is an increase of nearly 20% since 2013 and represents the largest increase in renewables in the history of our great province. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to making progress on this important file with all members and people across our province. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Queen's County Girls' Choir is entering its 18th season under the direction of Christopher Snurby, and it would be an understatement to say that they have, been met, they have met with much success. Last May, after successfully completing challenging auditions, 19 very talented young women traveled with their director, accompanist Allison Williams, and selected chaperones to Walt Disney World in Florida. On May 17th, they delivered an incredible performance on the world stage, wowing their audience. In addition to their official performance at Disney, the ladies also sang for bystanders in the airport at 40,000 feet when their airline crew put on a special request. They definitely made memories that will last a lifetime. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members to join me in congratulating the choir on yet another impressive achievement and wish them continued success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, it's no exaggeration to say that the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act looms large in Nova Scotia politics. 
The legislation, which was brought forward by Progressive Conservative Environment Minister Mark Parent and shaped by his then Deputy Minister Bill Leahy, set Nova Scotia down a path to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and and progress on other environmental fronts. And the NDP followed that path, introducing the ComFit program that allowed communities to benefit from the development of renewable energy. When I was elected, Nova Scotia had already met most of the goals that were set under the Environmental Goals and Sustainable Prosperity Act. And now, two years late, and with evidence of such need for ambition and for bravery to confront the climate crisis, consultation on new EGSPA goals are happening only online and only for a short time. This is a time for stretch goals, for challenging ourselves, and I look forward to real evidence that this government is ready to do that. The Honourable Member for Chester St. Margaret's. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians are embracing solar energy. Homeowners are taking greater control over their energy future while reducing carbon emissions. In the past year alone, 500 Nova Scotians have installed solar panels at their homes. Some of this progress is thanks to our Solar Homes program administered by Efficiency Nova Scotia, incentivizing the generation of solar energy in our province. When we started this program just a few years ago, our province was home to only 13 solar panel installers. As of this year, that number has grown to 57, representing hundreds of jobs clean, green jobs. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to be part of a government that is committed to growing clean energy in our province, allowing people to save money on their electricity bills while helping fight climate change. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sure. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Mr. Speaker, congratulations to La Boulangerie au coin of Petit Tang for over 60 years of successful business. Also known as a Coins Bakery, they have become a staple on the tables of families across Inverness County. Alec and Annie Blanche O'Coin started their family business in 1959. It took courage and commitment, but it continues to reward their family to this day. How wonderful it is to make a meaningful product people can enjoy each day. May we in this legislature acknowledge the O'Coin family and all of their staff, past and present, for their success and contribution to our Nova Scotian economy. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth North. Mr. Speaker, the late great poet Mary Oliver once wrote in an essay, Teach the children. We don't matter much, but the children do. While I love this sentiment, I think that lately, and in, today in particular, it is the children that are teaching us. Yesterday, when debating the climate crisis, I became emotional. This happened because I am fearful. I feel a profound anxiety for the future of our planet, this province, our children, my own two young children. Today, as we are all aware, the youth are taking to the streets of Dubuktuk and around the world for the strike for climate justice. Their voices have been loud, their actions inspiring, and their demands clear. But it's us and not the youth that have to change the laws. We have the knowledge, we have the ability, we have the tools to combat this climate crisis, but we need to have the will and we need to stop prioritizing profits over people and the planet. And so today I stand here on what will no doubt be an historic day in the fight against climate change in solidarity with the young strikers. I will join them, including my own children, in the street, and I will continue to use my voice in this House to fight for their future and the future of our planet. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax Atlantic. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we only get one climate, only one environment, and only one planet Earth. As humans, we have the privilege of being stalwarts of this planet. Finally, all parties, all communities, all countries are acknowledging this global crisis. Locally, Mr. Speaker, the people of Harrisfield are keenly aware of the importance of the local environment on their communities, their friends, and their families. After well over a decade, multiple governments and parties, they finally got the news they so desperately fought for. The vacancy in the insight in their community will be cleaned and brought back to its near original green state. Thank you to Marlene Brown, Melissa King, and the entire community that fought for the environment because they know firsthand the importance of fresh, clean air, water, and soil has on their physical and mental health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cole Harbour, Eastern Passage. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge and show appreciation to the Good Life Fitness Centre in our community for their kind and generous act. 
Good Life graciously opened the doors to all of their facilities in Nova Scotia to those in need of shower facilities, including soap, shampoo, conditioners, blow dryers, and towels. The centres also invited Nova Scotians to use the electrical outlets at Good Life to charge their electronic devices. Hurricane Dorian hit Nova Scotia hard September 7, 2019, leaving many thousands of families without power and basic amenities for, in some cases, days. Kind gestures like this from business owners in our communities do not go unnoticed. I ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in thanking Good Life Fitness Centres around the province for opening their doors to our communities in such a time of need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, almost three years ago on Thanksgiving Day in 2016, Cape Breton experienced significant flooding due to heavy rains. The flooding damaged hundreds of people's homes and destroyed property. Many people experienced hardship. This is part of the impact of growing climate uncertainty as weather patterns change and storms become more intense. Rising sea levels and leading to coastal erosion in our communities and the impact of Hurricane Dorian has caused further damage. There is much to be done to mitigate the efforts of climate change in Cape Breton and to protect people's homes from extreme weather. Mr. Speaker, people in Cape Breton need our government to take climate change seriously, and we need real investment to help our island prepare and adapt to a chi changing climate. The Honourable Member for Lunenburg. Mr. Speaker, over the next four years, our government is investing $120 million into projects that reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. When it comes to climate change, talk is cheap. Real action is needed to combat this issue. We need to transform the way we live our lives. We need to drive differently, heat our homes differently, produce our energy differently, just to name a few. Climate action should be a priority of all parties in this House. We have seen attacks on the carbon pricing, but remediation comes at a cost. Climate action is worth the price, Mr. Speaker. Let us all collaborate, not just by our talk, but by our actions. Let us be the change makers. Mr. Speaker, I hope this House continues to pursue the policies that will ensure an habitable planet for not just my children and grandchildren, but all children and grandchildren. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to congratulate and thank Escazoni's own Emma Stevens on her highly successful rendition in Migma of the Beatles song, Blackbird. Her rendition was recognized by Beatles frontman, Paul McCartney, who was quoted as saying, there's an incredible version done by a Canadian girl in her native language. It's really cool. On May 27th, Emma took to the stage in front of the UN Habitat Assembly in Nairobi, Kenya, to raise awareness about the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, where she honored the women and girls by singing the Big Ma honor song. Although she's already a star, not only in her home of Escazoni, but beyond. The future has a lot in store for this young lady, and I ask the members of the Legislature to join me in wishing her every future success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dermot North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to wish an enthusiastic, happy 80th birthday to Sylvia Anthony. It's difficult to name a community organization in Dartmouth North that Sylvia Anthony has not run or is currently running. Sylvia is involved in a number of initiatives aimed at improving the lives of people living in North End Dartmouth, such as Between the Bridges, the Feral Benevolent Society. She organizes monthly neighborhood watch meetings, and she's active in fundraising for the Holy Trinity Emanuel Church's Christmas Hamper Program. And she highlights all of the great things happening in the area through her role as the president of the North Dartmouth Echo, our community newspaper. Sylvia is at the heart of Dartmouth North, and so on behalf of the community, I want to thank her for all she has done and continues to do and wish her well on this very special day. The Honourable Member for Clayton Park West. Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to building and improving cycling infra infrastructure. Cycling leads to less pollution, less congestion, making Halifax and other cities and towns in our province more sustainable and more livable. Our province, in tandem with the federal and municipal government, made a $25 million investment into cycling infrastructure in Halifax. Bikeways, 
built with, with this money will make cycling into a more accessible and safer way to get around Halifax, helping address traffic and pollution at the same time. It's important to note the health benefits that come with increased physical activity. This new infrastructure may well save our healthcare, uh, healthcare system millions of dollars by in incentivizing people to cycle instead of using their car. I am hoping to be the first MLA to cycle to the legislature once this bikeway is built. Mr. Speaker, I am proud to be part of this government that is committed to expanding options when it comes to getting around Halifax. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Sydney River, Myra Lewisburg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to congratulate Mabel Wadden of Catalonia, who was recently awarded a Senate 150th Anniversary Medal. Mabel was presented with this medal from Cape Breton Regional Municipality Mayor Cecil Clark and Senator Michael McDonald at the Catalonia Recreation Centre. This medal is awarded to Canadians actively involved in their communities who, through hard work, dedication, and volunteerism make their communities and hometowns better places to visit, live, and grow up. Mabel Wadden met this criteria overwhelmingly. There are not many events that happen in Catalonia, <laughs> Lewisburg, and all surrounding areas that Mabel Wadden is not actively involved in. She is one in a million with a heart of gold. I stand here today to thank you and congratulate Mabel Wadden for all her hard work and look forward to many more years of her wonderful smile that greets everyone who meets her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Hans East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As a former Minister of Environment, climate change has always been a priority for me, especially after hearing the Environment Minister for none of it talk about the disappearance of, the, of permafrost and the resulting crumbling of their town buildings. Imagine, Mr. Speaker. That's why this government has been aggressively reducing our reliance on coal. Coal may have a rich history in our province, and we all know it contributes greatly to climate change. For decades, our province has relied mostly on coal, and just a decade ago, 80% of our electricity was generated by burning coal. Under the leadership of this government, that rate has dropped to 30%. This massive ship re represents thousands of new clean energy jobs and millions of tons in reduced carbon dioxide emissions. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to uh, I look forward to our government continuing its current direction and as they dilig diligently strive to promote clean and sustainable alternatives as coal-based energy. Thank you. The Honourable Member for sackville Cobbacree. Hey, hey. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Mr. Roy Corey for his outstanding accomplishments. Since coming to Canada from Syria in the early 1990s, he has opened five restaurants in the Halifax area. His latest is the Shwarma King restaurant located in Lower Sackville. Mr. Corey cooks his Middle Eastern cuisine just as he did back in Syria, ensuring that his customers enjoy a distinctive Syrian taste. Because most of his customers are Canadians, Mr. Corey has spent a lot of time explaining how he prepares his menu and providing samples to his customers. This has proven to be a positive experience for both his customers and his business. I would like to ask all members of the Nova Scotia Legislature to join me in congratulating Mr. Roy Corey and his staff for his achievement and their achievement and wish them continued success in the future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to pay tribute and celebrate the achievements of the St. Peter's and Area Lions Club, a respected organization in Richmond County. On Saturday, September 21, 2019, I was honoured to accept an invitation to speak at the club's 50th anniversary dinner and awards night in St. Peter's. Mr. Speaker, the Lions Club has tirelessly supported local individuals and organizations in our area. The club, made up of local men and women, identify needs in the community and provide support. They constructed the community's recreation grounds. They have built a world-class marina and community hall in the Bredor Lakes. They provide student bursaries, partner with local organizations and schools, and assist with program development and leadership initiatives. They also provide opportunities to residents to experience educational and culturally rich performances in the arts. Mr. Speaker, I ask the members of this House to join me in extending our congratulations and appreciation to the St. Peter's and Area Lions Club for their years of dedicated service to our community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honourable Member for Kings South. <coughs> Excuse me. Mr. Speaker, recently I had the privilege of highlighting to members of this House the achievements of a young local tradesman from Cambridge, Zach Walsh, an apprentice who won gold in 2017 and 2018 as part of Team Nova Scotia's refrigeration and AC team at the Skills Canada Nationals, now has excelled on the world stage. This year, Zach was named as one of 32 members to the World Skills Team Canada. World Skills is the largest vocational education and skills excellence event in the world, which was held this August in Kazan, Russia. His skills in his trade were tested against the best students and apprentices from around the world, and for his remarkable talents, he was awarded the Medallion of Excellence. I invite all members of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly to join me in congratulating Zach Walsh on dedicating himself to his trade, developing his skills to the highest level, and now being recognized internationally in the winning of the Medallion of Excellence at the World Skills Competition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to rise today and offer my sincere congratulations to Frank MacArthur, President of the Pictou County Kennel Club, President of the Maritime Golden Retriever Club, and the Atlantic Director of the National Golden Retriever Club. Pictou County Kennel Club hosted the Golden Retriever National and Maritime Golden Retriever Regionals at the Sobeys Indoor Sports Complex in Sellerton, along with the Pictou County All-Breed Dog Show between September 5th and 8th. 2019. MacArthur said they had dog owners from all across Canada, as well as participants from the U.S. that took part in this event. This is the first time the national event was held in Stellarton, and there were approximately 240 dogs that took part throughout the weekend. Mr. Speaker, I want to commend Frank MacArthur for his outstanding work and commitment to the showcasing of the good-natured, energetic, and photogenic Golden Retrievers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Bedford. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In May, longtime Bedford resident June Boswell received a volunteer award for her many contributions to the Fort Sackville Foundation, which operates our local historical museum, Scott Manor House. It was a well-deserved honour. June had served in many capacities, everything from the Finance Committee to directing the production of a video on the Halifax explosion. But the truth is that June volunteered for so many organizations in so many ways for so long that I will not be able to do her justice here today. Day. June was a founding member of the Nova Scotia Gambia Association and was their treasurer. She managed the Halifax office for 25 years. At Bedford United Church, she served as an elder, a member of the Education and Outreach Committees, and was an all-around good person who saw stuff that needed to be done, and she did it. She began donating blood in 1956 and made 135 donations in all. Just a few weeks after she received this latest award, June passed away. It was a very quick illness, and so many did not get the chance to convey to her in what high esteem we held her. I'm going to miss her. She leaves a big hole to fill. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize these students and young Nova Scotians who will be participating in the climate strike uh, today. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, this legislature had an emergency debate on climate change. Many great points were made, especially the message that we must act with a sense of urgency. Mr. Speaker, over the years, members of this House have raised their concerns regarding youth engagement in politics and public policy. I believe, Mr. Speaker, we are about to witness youth political engagement at its finest. It will be a protest that will be remembered in the history books. Mr. Speaker, I ask all members of this House to recognize that climate change is the number one concern for young Nova Scotians and to commend our students for, the per for their participation in the democratic process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Colchester North. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Each year, St. Francis Xavier University presents an exceptional award which recognizes individuals who go above and beyond to contribute in a positive manner to St. of X Athletics. Riley Jennings from DeBert Colchester North, a fourth year human kinetic student and thrower with the X track and field team, received this prestigious award for his many contributions to the university. He was involved with the motor activities at X program, volunteering <coughs> weekly with individuals 
individuals with disabilities. He participated in the Autism Learn to Skate swim program, was a St. Evex Fit for Life, Fit for Tots volunteer, coached throwing to local high school athletes with the Antigonish Track and Field Club, was a facilitator with the Antigonish Multi-Sport Program, and assisted with the design of the inclusive sledge hockey program at X. Jennings also took part in Harvest for Hunger, Halloween Safe Crossing event, and the Men's March for Violence Against Women. Riley Jennings is to be commended for his athletic achievements and for his generosity in giving his time, knowledge, and skills to others. Well done, Riley. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it's more important today than it's ever been for teachers to keep abreast of issues and events that impact positively and negatively the lives and well-being of the students. It is with great appreciation that I recognize the contribution of the Nova Scotia Teachers Union for its ongoing assistance to education research for teachers. For 16 years, an annual fund of 3,500 has been available with no individual award exceeding 450. I wish to congratulate Stephanie George of Colchester East Hants on her education research award certificate for It's a Girl Thing in Nova Scotia Schools, Shining from the Inside Out, and for her commitment to taking her professional development above and beyond requirements. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings West. Mr. Speaker, today I would like to give praise to an individual who was recognized uh, during the 2019 Support for Sport Awards. This individual was identified for her volunteer work, dedication to ensuring Canada's youth get to partake in our national sport. Sarah White is the president of the Valley Thunder Lacrosse Association. Sarah has played a key role in running uh, triad clinics and initiating the Scotia Minor Lacrosse League. The, this organization allows athletes in the Annapolis Valley, Truro, Picto and Cape Breton the chance to play the sport they love. She is a key volunteer and organizer of the annual Apple Cup, now in its sixth year. Sarah is constantly promoting lacrosse in her community and she adores helping others. Mr. Speaker, I request that all members of this house join me in applauding Sarah White for her incredible service and devotion to her volunteer work, which has allowed many young athletes find the, their love for sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Sackville Beaverbank. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I stood in the House and talked about the uh, youth led climate uh, strike in March that is uh, happening today. Uh, additionally, yesterday we held our emergency debate in regards to climate change, and today many members uh, from all parties in this House have rose uh, to express their concerns in regards to climate change. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to request that with the unanimous consent of this House, uh, members of this House, that the business of the House be recessed if we're still here when the student march arrives at Province House today so that those members who would like to attend outside and show our support for climate crisis would be able to do so. Okay. Hey. <clears throat> I'd like to remind the honourable member, the member statement section of the agenda is not to be used to request any action of the House. So if you want to bring that up, uh, we'll ask you to do that at, uh, the, okay. at the conclusion much, of Mr. member Speaker, statements. Mr. Premier. <laughs> the honourable member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, we often hear in this House about Nova Scotia's accomplishments in export sales, be it uh, tourism or fish, but in an era of climate change, many thinkers and leaders are urging us to think of ways to relocalize our economy in order to build resilience. And so in that vein, I congratulate the farmers across the province who are persevering despite climate uncertainty, the parents and organizers and activists who are working to bring local food into schools for lunch programs on the South Shore and in the Valley, municipalities showing leadership by developing local energy utilities, and social enterprises that are finding ways to spread the economic benefit uh, through procurement and innovative product development. And I urge uh, our government to work with all of those leaders to uh, balance uh, 
our, our championing of exports with a recognition that we need to actually build resilience through import replacement as well. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Guysboro Eastern Shore, Trackety. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise today in recognition of a local environmental group, the Shedabucto Green Team, who participated in the Great Nova Scotia Pick Me Up, the 13th annual Provincial Adapt to Highway Day earlier this year. Litter can be a real problem along the highways, which can detract from the beauty of our communities and the wonderful natural environment that surrounds us here in Nova Scotia. So local community efforts to clean up our roadsides makes a difference for all of us. Most notably, during the Guys for Clean Up, volunteers filled over 30 bags of garbage in two hours, making a significant impact in the fight to protect, reduce litter, and improve the look of our roadsides. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work and dedication shown by the Shedabucto Green Team and the eff efforts of those participating in the Adopt a Highway program for doing their part to protect the environment and keep our province green. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I beg leave to make an introduction. Permission granted. Mr. Speaker, in the West Gallery is my constituent April Ketty, a remarkable lady with a very rare life-threatening genetic illness, of which only two others in Canada have. She's a survivor and a fighter and has already outlived her doctor's expectations. Due to her condition, she has only 22% lung capacity, and during the extended power outage due to Hurricane Dorian was at grave risk of running out of oxygen. She's here today to speak to the need for a better home oxygen program. I ask April to stand and receive the warm welcome of the House. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, hundreds of Nova Scotians for various re health reasons are on home oxygen. This helps reduce the burden on our health care system as they would otherwise be in hospitals, plus has the added benefit of keeping them home. However, events like Hurricane Dorian exposed pro problems in the home oxygen pl services plan. The program was never designed to accept patients with oxygen liter flows over five liters per minute, and there are now some on 10 liters a minute. It was also never designed to sustain patients for more than 12 hours of backup standby oxygen. During the home power outage due to Dorian, many went without power for five to eight days. Simply put, the Home Oxygen Services Plan needs to be strengthened to reflect current usage needs and power outage realities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Armdale. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday evening I had the distinct pleasure of once again joining the annual Lady Ball here in Halifax. For, may, for members who may be unfamiliar, the Lady Ball celebrates women of all ages, backgrounds, sizes, occupations, and walks of life in the face of ovarian cancer. The event is the signature fundraiser for Ovarian Cancer Canada, allowing them to further their advocacy for more research into the condition and support of, for those who face it. 2,800 Canadian women are diagnosed with ovarian cancer each year, but only 2.1% of cancer-related donations are directed towards ovarian cancer. This is why we need to have the lady balls to raise awareness and tell the stories of people and families affected by the disease. I want to recognize all those who walked the runway in support of ovarian cancer, as well as their escorts who are here for her, including our colleagues, uh, the members here in the legislature from Annapolis, Bedford, Clayton Park West, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville, and Cumberland North, as well as Halifax MP Andy Fillmore. Thank you to Emily Chason, Regional Director for Ovarian Cancer, and thank you to everybody. The time allotted for member <laughs> statements has expired. We'll now move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past summer, the PC Caucus made a request for information under the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act. The information we were seeking was very specific. <clears throat> How much is the province of Nova Scotia paying to outside legal counsel in relation to the Alex Cameron case? Mr. Speaker, every word of the FOIPOP response was redacted. Every single word. The excuse was that the cost of legal advice was privileged information. Again, we weren't asking for the content of the advice, just the cost. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Premier, will the Premier explain to Nova Scotians why they are not entitled to know how this government is spending their money? The Honourable Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the for the question. Uh, I want to thank, uh, tell him uh, 
Uh, I don't deal with the boy pops, quite frankly, Mr. Speaker. They would go through the normal process that happens in the department. Uh, typically, what would happen has happened before is when we sought legal advice. As the court proceeding was ongoing, the information is not sent out. Thereafter, it is actually communicated to Nova Scotia to the entire cost uh, associated with uh, all of the legal challenges that may be before the courts on behalf of the province. Uh, but I will certainly endeavour to ask that question. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the, uh, the Premier's uh, response there. It is right to know week, and it's a time when we talk about what information our government shares and what information it chooses not to share. Under the FOIPOP process, our office has the right to appeal the decision of the government to redact every single word, and we did appeal it. <clears throat> but when we did, our office was told that the review officers are currently conducting reviews on appeals from two and a half years ago. And it might be some time before our appeal could actually be actioned. A two and a half year backlog to, sec to access information this government has chosen to hide. Does the Premier think that the backlog of two and a half years fulfills the public's right to know? The Honourable Premier. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I thank the, the Honourable Member for the question. What he left out of the question, uh, Mr. Speaker, in his preamble was the fact of the matter. Uh, Floyd Pops coming into this government, Mr. Speaker, at a record level going out in 30 days. Mr. Speaker, over 80 per cent of the Floyd Pops that come into the province are back out in 80 days, in 30 days, Mr. Speaker. That is leading, Mr. Speaker, any government in the history of this province. We're going to continue to improve that to ensure that it goes out. And the Honourable Member, when he's referring to some of the backlogs, our number of complicated uh, Floyd Pops that come into departments who are dealing with a whole host of things, and they'll continue to do it when the appeals come through, and I'm sure the Honourable Member, as soon as that department can get to, to his appeal, will do so. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on his final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, due respect, it's not much complicated in how much did you spend. It's a very simple question. And the, these reviews to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, that are submitted to the FOIPOP office, this shouldn't take more than 90 days. And yet the former Privacy Commissioner has warned that the backlog is continuing to grow the two and a half years, probably going to grow under the path we're on now. The laws that protect the government information, they're already robust, Mr. Speaker. And by delaying the appeals process, government becomes more and more secretive, more and more evasive. And, and, and really what the process does is it allows this government to hide information and then let it sit for years before anyone can have their appeal heard. Does the Premier acknowledge that delaying the FOIPOP appeal process for years is equ just equivalent to ignoring the initial request. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, what I don't agree with is the Honourable Member's preamble. He's suggesting that FOI POP should take 90 days. Mr. Speaker, we believe they should take 30. That's why over 80 per cent is going out the door in 30 days. Nova Scotians deserve the right to know. Mr. Speaker, it's a glimpse into what the Tories believe when it comes to open government. Mr. Speaker, they want to continue to hide more, and they're only in opposition. Imagine if they ever got on this side, though, what would happen. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, the, the Premier speaks repeatedly about how we're on track to surpass federal greenhouse gas emissions targets. But what he doesn't say is that these federal targets are identical to the targets set by Stephen Harper, which are recognized globally as being so inadequate that they would put the world on track for the catastrophe of warming of at least three degrees. So this is not anything to particularly crow about. All of the celebratory statements from the government about its progress and all the congratulatory rhetoric about how far we've come and all, all the proclamations about the desire to work together, none of this amounts to much without the legislated targets to back it up. So on this day of the historic climate strike, I want to ask the Premier if he will commit to legislating emissions targets that are consistent with containing global warming within 1.5 degrees. Just before we go to the Premier, I'd like to remind all members that the use of electronic devices during question period is strictly prohibited. The Honourable Premier. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, I, I think the Honourable Member should take a moment and celebrate Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker, who achieved that target. Uh, today, Mr. Speaker, the targets that were set out for 2030. We've achieved those targets today, Mr. Speaker, and Nova Scotians, because of their commitment to ensuring that we do more than our part to clean up the environment, will we'll more than exceed that target by 2030. We're not stopping. 
We're going to continue to uh, make sure that we green uh, the energy environment in this province, that we continue to retrofit houses to reduce the carbon footprint of individuals, Nova Scotians, on the environment side. We're going to continue to lead the country when it comes to waste diversion, Mr. Speaker. As the honourable members would have known yesterday, we set aside a Coastal Protection Act the first in its time, first of its kind in this country, Mr. Speaker. Those are all positive steps moving in the right direction. And I want to tell the honourable member, Minister of Environment, we'll have more to say, Mr. Speaker, on the path we set out, on the ambitious path we set out with Nova Scotians in the coming weeks. The honourable leader of the New Democratic Party. Relatedly, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to ask the Premier about renewables. I, I am with the Premier in taking pride in the fact that we're on track to meet the target of 40% renewables by 2020, but I also hope that he is with me in recognizing that even after we meet this target, still the majority of our energy will be coming from burning fossil fuels. The recent report from Gardner Pinfold and the Ecology Action Centre submits that a target of 90% renewables by 2030 is what's required for our share of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees. Mr. Speaker, on this such an historic Climate Action Day in our province, will the Premier of the province commit to bringing forward renewable energy targets that are consistent with containing global warming within 1.5 degrees. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. As I said, the Minister of Environment will uh, have more to say, Mr. Speaker, an ambitious uh, program that we'll set for Nova Scotia when it comes to continuing on our path. Uh, the Honourable Member is certainly right when it comes to the energy mix in our province. We'll continue to make sure we green up the energy market. I want to tell the Honourable Member I hope he will continue to support uh, the vision that we have around ensuring that we have a more robust transmission system in Atlantic Canada so that we can continue to uh, make avail to Nova Scotians more hydroelectricity in Newfoundland and Labrador. Quite frankly, the opportunity to buy hydro out of Quebec uh, would be a positive step to continue to allow us to move off the fossil fuels. And quite frankly, I believe we're going to harness the Bay of Funday. We need to make investments in that infrastructure. We need to make investments in our infrastructure to move that energy around so that Nova Scotians can avail themselves of that energy, quite frankly, and we can sell the excess to the global marketplace to bring that much needed capital back in to continue to green up this province. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, very, very shortly, there are going to be hundreds, more likely thousands of people, young and old and in between, marching for their future right outside our legislative doors. And young people have been striking on Fridays for months in order uh, to have their voices heard, and, and they, along with legions of scientists and activists and ex experts, are hungry to share what they have to say, if only they could get a government to effectively listen. So on this day, when so many climate voices are and are going to be being raised, can the Premier explain how he decided that three little questions in an online form over only 30 days would be, in his view, an adequate consultation to gather the wealth and the, the depth of input that's required uh, to create a strong and sound update to Nova Scotia's environmental goals and sustainable prosperity legislation? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable for the question. He would know there's been an ongoing consultation. He would know uh, the legislation that would have gone through uh, the government that he was part of has together with it a committee that is overseeing uh, this, this program, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, engage uh, Nova Scotians, Mr. Speaker. We've heard young people uh, yesterday. We had an emergency debate in this House. I asked uh, the Honourable Member and members of this House uh, to provide us with suggestions, Mr. Speaker. I didn't hear any. I'm waiting. I'm open to hear what they want to say, what the, uh, they see as a future path and how we renew this program to move forward. This is not something that just belongs to the government of Nova Scotia this particular day. It is something that belongs to all of us, and I'm looking forward to the young people who will show up here today, and I'm looking forward to the suggestions that I hope the opposition will provide to the minister and to our government. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier takes great pride in his target of turning FOIPOP requests around in 30 days. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, when, you're, when a response to a FOIPOP request is a piece of paper where every single word is redacted, you should set a target of responding in 30 minutes, because we know that an adequate response is not coming. According to the, <clears throat> what we're talking about is the appeal process, to hold this government accountable. The appeal should be processed in a timely amount of time. According to the former Privacy Commissioner, her office received 562 appeals. 
2018, 2019, 562 appeals. Then to put another way, that's 562 times this government refused to share information that citizens thought they were entitled to know. 479 were resolved of the 562, which means the backlog continues to grow. This is a simple brute force problem. More resources, more resolutions to hold the government accountable. Will this Premier be willing to be held accountable to delivering meaningful responses and commit to providing the resources necessary to clear the backlog of the Floyd Pop repeals? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, this is not something, uh, Mr. Speaker, that should be cavalierly thrown around the host of the floor for political reasons. The Honourable Member suggested everything should come out in 30 minutes. I believe we want, uh, Mr. Speaker, Nova Scotians to know the information required, but they also want to know, Mr. Speaker, that their information they provide to government is protected when it needs to be protected, Mr. Speaker, and that takes time. We allow those hard-working public servants who are doing that job on behalf of all Nova Scotians and departments across the province, Mr. Speaker, to continue to do that work. And I want to remind the Honourable Member we've continued to move the target that the FOI pops coming into our government are getting out in 30 days, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. I'd love to have a discussion about this ability to keep private information private. We all know how they've done on that score, Mr. Speaker. The reality is the responses to the FOI pops are not meaningful. They're not providing information that they should be. They're hiding information from Nova Scotians. In 2018-2019, there was 1,985 FOIPOP requests. That means, when you think that 562 were appealed, one in four times meaningful information is not being provided to Nova Scotians. It's being hidden from Nova Scotians. And the people who are appealing have no sense of when their appeal will be resolved. It's going to be years for certain. Does the Premier understand that the delays in the appeal process make it appear as though this government, his government, is deliberately working to avoid transparency, intentionally hiding information from taxpayers. The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, quite the opposite, Mr. Speaker. We have an open data portal, Mr. Speaker, the first uh, government to do that, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the Honourable Member it was this government that put uh, expenses online, Mr. Speaker, from those of us, and continue to say, Mr. Speaker, that is opening up. Uh, government to uh, Nova Scotians to uh, scrutinize what we do, Mr. Speaker. I want to remind the Honourable Member uh, we continue to have over 82 percent of the FOI pops that come in uh, to our government are out in 30 days, Mr. Speaker. That is an all time high in this province, Mr. Speaker. This is not a government, Mr. Speaker, that is avoiding putting information out, Mr. Speaker. It's actually, we're doing it faster, Mr. Speaker, than any government has done it in the history of this province. The Honourable House Leader for the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Business. We know that the fallout from the climate crisis will have wide and far-reaching impacts on both our environment and our economy if the opportunity is not seized to get ahead of the crisis. For example, we know that the agricultural industry, the fishery and the wine industry together represent over $1 billion of economic activity. They are all threatened by droughts, floods, changing weather patterns, warming ocean temperatures and extreme weather events, some of which we heard about from our colleagues yesterday. Can the minister please describe what analysis his department has done on the number of jobs that are at risk due to climate change? The Honourable Minister of Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. Um, I think it's fair to say that the Department of Business uh, doesn't entertain that type of analysis. Um, this is a, a challenge for everyone, uh, for all departments, for all members of this House, for, for the private sector, as much as it is for the Department of Environment or, or Lands and Forests, national governments, provincial governments. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, climate changes are affecting our economy in, in, a, major, in a major way. Um, the, the industries that the, the member had mentioned are certainly feeling that uh, with respect to the, to the weather patterns and the, and the things that we're seeing. So, obviously, uh, we are acting. That's why uh, we uh, we become national leaders in the in the fight to reduce GHG uh, emissions. That's why today is such an important conversation. And again, uh, we're like-minded as the premier, our government, and all members of this house. Uh, we're committed to doing our, our our job and our role in fighting climate change. And we'll make sure that we protect the economy, but of course, always protect the environment. Thanks. The honourable house leader for the New Democratic Party. With all due respect, Mr. Speaker, the Department of Business should be taking a leadership role in this file. Our caucus has described many times the incredible economic and environmental opportunity should this government take leadership to transform the economy, 
Contrary to the Premier's assertion that we haven't offered constructive advice, we have repeatedly pointed out that thousands of jobs are available through energy efficiency and retrofitting programs, some of which this government is participating in, but we could be doing so much more. Renewable energy sectors and other green industries should be at the forefront. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please describe what analysis his department has done on how many jobs can be created through transformation to a green economy? The Honourable Minister of Business. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank the member for the question. Uh, that's exactly what we're doing, and that's what we'll continue to do. Uh, there's no doubt about it. It's, it's no secret to the private sector, uh, those traditional industries that uh, uh, were uh, responsible for CO2 uh, emissions, uh, those who, who are, are participating in fossil fuels, and those who uh, have, a, have a large uh, negative environmental footprint. The Department of, of Lands and Forests, the Department of Energy, uh, the ministers have laid uh, quite frankly that uh, that economy is it's not emerging, it's not on the horizon, it's here. And I think that uh, over the course of uh, our mandate, uh, what we have uh, in terms of uh, environmental uh, investment, but also in the, in the job creations uh, around the, the green economy and what exists, uh, we are doing that. We'll continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. We're all very proud of our record. That's why we are, we are taking a very serious tact around protecting the environment, but also protecting jobs so that we have Nova Scotians staying home, returning home, being here and participating in the new economy. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westbound. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Finance. Probably the image that will forever be closely associated with Hurricane Dorian is the collapse of the crane in South Park Street. The province has stepped in to ensure that the site can be secured and the crane can be removed. I accept and agree that moving swiftly to ensure the safe, safety of persons and property was the right course of action. My concern now is the potential follow. My question to the Minister, at the time the decision was made to assume liability for the crane, was a potential cost envelope ever discussed, and if so, what was the ballpark range that was presented? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Welcome and thank you. Uh, to your to your question, uh, the question was raised. It's been raised. Uh, it's been asked uh, ever since the uh, the hurricane, and that was the the dangerous uh, situation that was created with the uh, toppled uh, crane. Uh, immediately, we needed to look at how do we protect. Uh, people and property. That was our number one priority. When we declared that as a localized state of emergency, that was exactly what was that, that was to do. We recognized that there will be costs related to that, but we did not want the costs to hold us back from protecting our people in Nova Scotia. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last week the Minister presented updated finances for the province. A $33 million surplus has been trimmed back to $30 million. I don't know what the cost might be before we're removing a collapsed crane, but when I think of worst-case scenario, where everything that can go wrong does go wrong, where everything is at the higher end of the estimate, and maybe even more, it's not hard to get to that $30 million. Is the minister concerned that the costs of the province's assumed liability could jeopardize the current surplus? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you uh, to the member for the question and through you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have uh, balanced the budget in this province for four consecutive years. We, we have been able to do that uh, through good fiscal management. We've been able to do that by living within our means. And if there is an unexpected cost that comes our way, like the frost freeze when we were not expecting that, that was not in the budget, but we were able to go back to our budget and make some revisions to make sure that that frost freeze uh, costs were covered so that our farmers and our fishermen, and farmers in particular, uh, were not hurt unduly by that. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Mr. Speaker, earlier today I uh, welcomed April Ketty, a constituent of mine. In the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, April was home without power for five days and she almost ran out of oxygen supply. The Home Oxygen Services Plan only provides for an E-tank supply backup for emergencies. The E-tank is a three-foot-tall aluminum tank that weighs eight pounds. If used continuously, it will run out of 
uh, oxygen in five to six hours. It is a small tank. So my question is, what does the minister have to say to people like April who are forced to use oxygen tanks that do not have enough emergency supply? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for uh, bringing the, the question, the concern uh, to the floor. I believe uh, during the, uh, the events a few weeks ago of Hurricane Dorian, uh, the EMO uh, services throughout the province uh, did uh, step up and, and respond, and, and the partners with our municipal uh, leaders and the EMO office uh, for the province. Uh, area of health care, Mr. Speaker, uh, the uh, question of oxygen, that is a, a, an item that did come to my attention, so it's something that we're looking into to find out uh, you know, what, uh, if any, uh, changes need to be made uh, going forward uh, to ensure that uh, patients do have an adequate uh, safe supply or a mechanism means uh, to replenish a supply in such an emergency in the future. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the Minister for that answer. In fact, it's also many small companies in Nova Scotia that provide this life-saving service, and they do their very best under the terms of the contract they have with this government, which limits the amount of oxygen they can supply. In fact, they go above and beyond the contract. Prior to uh, Hurricane Dorian, all emergency management officials suggested each resident in the province prepare for a 72-hour emergency supply kit. So my question to the minister is if, if residents are required to ha provide, have a 72-hour emergency supply, why does the province not provide a 72-hour emergency supply of oxygen to those requiring it? And will this be addressed in the new contract scheduled to take uh, effect in December of this year. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, we certainly uh, recognize uh, when uh, this uh, particular concern uh, brought uh, to my attention of uh, the uh, uh, residents uh, who uh, do rely on oxygen uh, in the province and, and uh, the impact and the, and the concerns that they had uh, when they didn't know how long the power uh, might uh, last or, or uh, the, their, their needs. So that, uh, Mr. Speaker, is why uh, in those very discussions with the uh, firms uh, that this is a, a topic of discussion through that process. So again, Mr. Speaker, we certainly recognize the, uh, the challenge and that's why we're taking the steps uh, in our discussions with the vendors to address. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister responsible for EMO. Mr. Speaker, I think we were all impressed in the days following Dorian of how our neighbours came to, together to assist one another. I know in Dartmouth East it was fantastic to see uh, people coming together to help one another clean up their <coughs> properties and to clear debris for seniors. However, communications following the storm were problematic, erratic and even non-existent in some areas. This proved to be a major challenge for residents of our community, as it was for many Nova Scotians. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister please tell us what steps are being taken to improve communication to ensure information is effectively transmitted to the public, especially when it pertains to the locations of provincially mandated Red Cross shelters? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to rise and to thank all Nova Scotians, as we've done in this house previously, uh, around uh, those who responded to early to uh, Hurricane Dorian, the preparedness that went out. Uh, Nova Scotians did heed that warning. Uh, Nova Scotians checked on their neighbours, their families, their friends, uh, Mr. Speaker, throughout. Uh, we realize in all of these kinds of events that take place, uh, Mr. Speaker, that there will be reviews done following that, debriefs, if you will. Uh, lessons will be learned from each of the events. We will look at this one uh, like we look at all past ones and look at the areas where we can improve, and we will continue to work on those efforts, Mr. Speaker, going forward. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, and certainly I hope the, the Minister in this government keeps Nova Scotians updated as to those reviews. As the Minister is aware, the days following Dorian, it left some Nova Scotians wondering where to place the debris from their property, the locations of the municipally operated comfort centres, and what government-run departments were open. Mr. Speaker, the storm impacted cell towers and residents' ability to call and check in on uh, friends and family, as well as stay up to date on storm-related information. I know in Dartmouth East, Mr. Speaker, our ability to convert a provincial shelter to a municipal comfort centre was delayed by a few hours because of poor communication and damage to cell towers. As a result, we were unable to coordinate in a timely manner because of poor lines of communication. 
My question is this. What is the plan for the department, from the department, to minimize cell tower disruption when storms like Dor Dorian occur? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and uh, we'll certainly be keeping Nova Scotians updated as this is part of our progress going forward, uh, as he has referred to. I can tell you that the Premier has uh, had conversations and continues to have conversations uh, with our telcos. That uh, happened immediately uh, during, uh, before the repairs were even complete, uh, right after this storm had passed. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we know uh, there are always challenges in any event. Uh, we're certain that the, those who had communications issue are probably also, uh, I hope, doing a debrief and learning from experiences that they've had. Um, and, and what things they need to do going forward. We certainly will be involved in having communications with them and all of our partners. And again, I want to thank all of our partners who do come to the table, Mr. Speaker, and make these events uh, not a positive experience by any means, but one that we uh, are able to get uh, looked after in a timely fashion, respond to. And we were again quite fortunate in Nova Scotia during this very wide storm, uh, large storm, Mr. Speaker, that there were no injuries or deaths related to the storm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. House Leader for the Official Opposition. Speaker, a question for the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs. Uh, another question about Hurricane Dorian. And uh, with the extended loss of power, uh, we see how important municipal water systems are, uh, how much uh, homes and businesses, and even volunteer fire departments depend on these systems. Mm. Sometimes those fire departments are acting as comfort stations. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in Inverness County, um, Shetty Camp was okay. They have a generator for their system. Uh, but Mabu uh, ran out of water. Uh, Port Hood, Waikawa, and Inverness almost ran out of water. Um, and I, I don't believe an electrical uh, setup is built to accommodate a generator for those systems. My question for the minister is who is responsible to ensure that an emergency management plan is in place to help people in places like Mabu, Port Hood, uh, Waikagama, and Inverness? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member uh, for that question. Uh, it states clearly within the Municipal Government Act that the, each and every municipality right across this province is responsible to uh, put together an emergency management plan and have a committee struck that helps look after the detail surrounding all of those. Coordinators are generally appointed, uh, as we've seen in many places throughout the province. It doesn't mean each one has to have their own coordinator, but they need a regional plan that works, and most of those are done with, within the municipality, and they can share coordinators uh, to broaden uh, their neighbouring uh, uh, responsibilities and how those things work around uh, emergencies, whether they be an event like a hurricane or any significant weather event or any event of any kind. The Honourable House Leader for the Official Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to ask the Minister, what, what is he seeing around the province? Are there other municipal ratepayers getting effective <laughs> services for the fees and taxes they are paying? And uh, I, I, I think my final question would be, um, you know, what is he seeing around the province? And also, what is the province doing and, and able to do to help municipalities who may need some assistance uh, in beefing up their emergency response plans so that citizens are protected and have what they need, especially in times where there's power outages and uh, loss of services, potentially? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, around the province, I would say that we have a good portion of these municipalities who are doing regionalized plans, doing local plans uh, to uh, help get them through uh, these sorts of events. Um, what we are doing, we have a great team at EMO, at Municipal Affairs and Housing, who are prepared to go out and work with uh, all municipalities on any number of things, including uh, getting ready for emergencies. And uh, where we've had issues, it'll be part of that review I spoke to in, uh, earlier on. Uh, we will be talking to these municipalities as well to say, how can we help you? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is also for the Minister responsible for emergency management. Communities across Nova Scotia, especially along the coast, are vulnerable to the effects of climate change and will be affected by sea level rise. Can the minister please describe what mapping and analysis his department is doing to help Nova Scotians prepare for the inevitable flood risks that will accompany rising sea levels? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, for the Honourable Member. There is a number of things going on. Uh, she may recall in this House last fall. We table to build a minimum uh, planning standards. Uh, also, the Coastal Protection Act is, is a bill before this House. And um, 
there's a lot of work around the mapping going on. Uh, that bill refers to things like setbacks and protection, not to build too close. Uh, we'll continue to work with our municipalities on just those topics. Everyone recognizes the issue around uh, climate change. We're certainly uh, hearing a lot about that this week already in early days. We'll hear lots more about that. And uh, we believe it's important in municipal affairs, and we'll continue to work with each and every municipality out there. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, recently our caucus submitted a Freedom of Information request asking for any flood risk mapping or analysis of sea level rise or extreme weather in the past year. And the response that from the department was that we are not entitled to the information requested. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please describe how it is that communities across this province are expected to plan for increased flooding if the government insists on keeping this information secret? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm not sure why you would be told uh, why you wouldn't be entitled to that. This is information that will be complete, that will be public. I can tell you, uh, as Minister, that we will ensure that Nova Scotians are aware, not only of the good work that is going on and the information we are gathering around flood mapping, we're doing that for a reason, to advise Nova Scotians to take the advice that we're providing them, to be prepared and to do the right thing as we move forward around our planning. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we'll be happy to share that information when it becomes available. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On September the 7th, Nova Scotia's municipalities braced for Hurricane Dorian. The Emergency Management Act states that the province has a responsibility to ensure there are emergency management plans in place for every municipality. There are 50 municipalities throughout the province. And the legislation, though, does not require for emergency management plans to be kept up to date. So my question to the Minister of Municipal Affairs is, did every municipality, all 50, have an emergency management plan in place? And is the minister confident that those plans were current and up to date? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, as I spoke a few minutes ago, we do have under the MGA, uh, the Municipal Government Act, that uh, every municipality, the uh, legislation is clear, shall have an emergency management plan. And we will be working with each and every municipality, as we do on many other things going forward, to ensure that they have the appropriate plans in place and that they do remain updated. That is a very important piece of uh, how we learn as we go along through each event. There are things that we can change. This document is very much fluid. It should be. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. And it might be something for the Minister to consider putting in place that emergency management plan should be updated either annually or every five years. Um, also, Mr. Speaker, the aftermath of Hurricane Dorian, we saw 80% or more of all Nova Scotians without power. Nova Scotia crews, our military, our emergency management staff worked tireless, tirelessly to have power restored throughout our province. But one issue that citizens came to many of us with concerns about the lack of vegetation control and the lack of tree, tree management, which many people believed led to the massive uh, loss of power throughout the province. So my question to the Minister of Municipal Affairs is, can the Minister clarify to us who is actually liable and responsible <clears throat> for vegetation and control and tree control around power lines? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. Um, again, I want to thank all those that took part. We had many partners at the table who worked around the clock. Our folks from Nova Scotia Power, she has mentioned, uh, worked for days, um, as, as many hours as they could, uh, getting power restored uh, right across this province. We do know the time of year. There's certainly more uh, uh, heavy foliage on the trees. The leaves are out. It makes it more difficult and challenging to do that job. So we'll continue to work with all our partners, uh, Mr. Speaker, going forward, including Nova Scotia Power, around these issues. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture. New research from the University of Guelph has found charcoal may be key to reducing ammonia pollution and lowering greenhouse gas emissions from crop fertilizers, <coughs> and I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. The study found that naturally occurring charcoal in soil can effectively soak up harmful greenhouse gases produced by ammonia, which is often found in fertilizers and is a natural byproduct of decomposition. The release of this nitrous oxide as a byproduct of ammonia is a large contributing factor to the greenhouse effect and major cause for concern because it has a higher warming potential. 
meaning that it has a higher capacity for holding heat. So my question to the Minister, can the Minister clarify how no research like this is followed and implemented by the Department when it comes to helping improve the modernization and improvement of Nova Scotia's agricultural sector? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the member for that question. Indeed, we are always looking for new innovative approaches to uh, making our, our agriculture industry more environmentally friendly and also to improve the practices on the farm. So we will take that into consideration. Thank you. The Honourable Minister, uh, Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the researcher behind this explained that some farmers already use charcoal as a way to improve certain soil quality where it's nitrogen deficient. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister clarify if some awareness project is or could be in the works that could use the aforementioned idea of charcoal use to promote soil fertility or nitrogen retention in otherwise agriculturally poor soil, as it would simultaneously be used to mitigate greenhouse gases? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Again, I want to thank the member for that important question. As I say, we're looking all the time at ways to reduce greenhouse gases on farms. And indeed, this may be another solution to that problem. And if it is, we will investigate it. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pickner West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. In 2016, I asked the then Minister of Health and Wellness why my constituents need to pay up to $200 to a company in Ontario for their own medical records. At the time, the Minister stated it was an area that his department was working on with Doctors Nova Scotia and the College of Physicians. And he agreed that there were too many Nova Scotians that could not afford to retrieve their medical records. Mr. Speaker, that was over three years ago, and I'm sad to say that still today I stand here and my constituents are still forced to pay out of pocket for their medical records. And I will table um, the Minister's remarks from back in 2016. My question is, what progress has been made in the last three years so that my constituents <coughs> can obtain their medical records for free? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the province certainly uh, recognizes the importance of uh, individual patients having access uh, to their, their medical uh, records. That's why uh, patients uh, or Nova Scotian citizens uh, who uh, want to access uh, or need to access their medical records that are available and under the, the control of the province or provincial entity like the Nova Scotia Health Authority can obtain those medical records for free. The challenge, Mr. Speaker, is in the primary care sector where physicians who are not employees of the government and operate as independent practitioners, uh, they have uh, their own operations. Mr. Speaker. The regulatory college does set parameters and governance around the uh, record uh, uh, retention policies uh, for the uh, physicians and as professionals in that regard. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, one of the things we're doing is uh, expanding and continuing our investments around My Health Nova Scotia because we think Nova Scotians should have access to the records, not just when a physician uh, retires or they change physicians, but indeed for everyday health care purposes. The Honourable Member for Pico West. So obviously, Mr. Speaker, progress has not been made because we're seeing in media there's constituents all across this province that are still having to pay for their records. I think things are difficult enough, Mr. Speaker, in our health care system that Nova Scotians should not have to pay out of their own uh, for their own medical history, especially when they don't even have a doctor. Um, maybe I shouldn't be too optimistic, and since. Um, the same promise was made two or three years ago about medical records. Um, I think that we can't depend on electronic medical records uh, coming forward. As we know, OPAR is uh, not being very successful moving forward. So will the minister ensure that those constituents who are out of pocket for access to their own medical records will be reimbursed by the department? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Again, uh, the importance of uh, access to uh, medical information is uh, and continues to be an important uh, priority for Nova Scotians, uh, for healthcare professionals, and indeed this government. Uh, that, Mr. Speaker, is why uh, we established in 2018 an incentive program to support uh, primary healthcare providers to transition and upgrade their uh, office uh, EMR, electronic medical record systems. That's to modernize and, and uh, standardize, I believe, 
about 75, 80% of physicians, primary care providers are using the same platform, Mr. Speaker, which makes it easier then for us to integrate with uh, our platform, My Health NS, which allows patients on the front line to get access to that information, Mr. Speaker, in real time. That's the path we're moving forward on, Mr. Speaker. So they'll have access not just when they transition to primary care providers, but in real time, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Services. Mr. Speaker, it has become common these days to see residents of Pictou Centre and surrounding area who are required to leave the area to receive primary care. It has long been the norm to travel to Halifax to see a specialist, but it was not usually the case when visiting a family doctor. Unfortunately, local family physicians are now few and far between. And if you are the recipient of income assistance, you can receive a small travel expense to see a specialist, but not for a family doctor. Questions to the minister. Does the minister recognize the extra burden placed on income assistance recipients in others due, due to the continuing shortage of family doctors? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for, for the question. I would uh, suggest in any situation where a constituent of his uh, is not able to access uh, a, a family doctor within their own area and has to travel elsewhere for that uh, particular care, <clears throat> that they go to their caseworker, contact their caseworker, explain the situation. Uh, we, one of our initiatives at uh, DCS is, is start with yes. How can we accommodate folks who need additional assistance? And so I would urge him to uh, ask his constituents to do that. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Pictou Centre. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my uh, constituent has gone to uh, to the local department. Uh, our office has, and uh, to no avail so far. Mr. Speaker, with no fix on the horizon for our present situation with respect to doctor shortages, this challenge persists for recipients of income assistance. We are talking about access to basic primary care, and it speaks to the ripple effect of the health care crisis where care is not accessible. People of limited income are left to stretch what dollars they have just to see a family doctor when one is not available near to them. Question to the Minister, will the Minister commit today to reviewing this travel policy and consider a travel allowance to assist income assistance recipients that must travel outside of their county to see a family doctor? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. What I will, uh, we want to make sure that all Nova Scotians have act, access to the health care that they need, Mr. Speaker, and that they're able to actually get there. So what I would uh, suggest that the Honourable Member uh, have a chat with me after this House and we'll, uh, and we'll uh, see what we can do around this particular issue. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Municipal Affairs. In the days after Hurricane Dorian, I drove around my constituency checking in on residents at risk, comfort centres, nursing homes, first responders and workers involved with the cleanup effort. I saw our armed forces land on our doorstep in Cape Breton, and I thank everyone who came forward during the aftermath to assist the people that I serve. I was concerned by, concerned by the storm, but just as concerned by the communication blackout that happened in the aftermath. In Cape Breton, Richmond, where in many places cell phone coverage is non-existent every day, suddenly constituents found themselves without landlines, without power, without internet, and without cell phone coverage. Even the local radio station uh, went down. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Municipal Affairs responsible for EMO please tell us what are the province's and municipalities' responsibilities to ensure proper maintenance is being done to our critical communication and electrical infrastructure? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. Uh, as we spoke a few minutes ago, uh, Hurricane Dorian did a lot of damage around the province, certainly. The Premier has spoke to our telecommunications <coughs> folks and continues to uh, work with them. Part of our debrief will also take in lessons learned. And as we move forward under reviews and uh, plan, as we always do, are continually planning uh, for the next event, this will certainly uh, play a role in that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton, Richmond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout Cape Breton, Richmond, it is painfully obvious that maintenance has been insufficient to trim trees away from phone lines and electrical lines. And with increasing incidence of high winds and hurricanes in our province, Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask the Minister, who is ultimately responsible to ensure reliable operation of critical and electrical communications infrastructure in this province? The Honourable Minister of Municipal Affairs. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, those that own those uh, services would certainly have some responsibility, no question about that. We would expect that they would uh, do the appropriate work. We'll continue to work with them like we do all of our partners uh, going forward. Those will be things, again, from the lessons learned that we look at and say, how do we do better? We always know, Mr. Mr. Speaker, from every event, we learn something, we can always improve. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Queen Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Wellness. Sadly for the people of Shelburne, ER closures have become the norm. I have constituents calling my office daily, worried about how they will access emergency services when needed. In September of last year, I asked the Minister for his plan to address the constant closures at the ER at Roseway. The Minister stated the Health Authority continues to work on recruitment and access services required for the ER units, and where it concerns the emergency Department Roseway, it is too soon to say, and I'll table that document. My question is, a year has passed and the people of Shelburne County need to know, what is the Minister's plan to stop the closures at Roseway ER? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as uh, indicated uh, previously, uh, the fact is uh, we all uh, recognize and appreciate uh, the concerns of Nova Scotians that are in communities where emergency department uh, closures are occurring uh, too often, uh, Mr. Speaker. But I want to assure uh, the member opposite and all Nova Scotians that steps are being taken. Uh, that's why we've taken steps, Mr. Speaker, like uh, expanding and enhancing uh, incentives, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, covered. I believe over uh, f the equivalent of uh, 500 uh, shifts, Mr. Speaker, uh, in emergency department uh, closures because of incentives like this. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've added to our uh, medical training programs at Dalhousie Medical School and the residency program. And just today, Mr. Speaker, our clerkship program, which has previously been announced, takes off in Cape Breton. The Honourable Member for Queen's Shelburne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Since June 1, 2019, the roadway has been closed 784 hours. That's 32 days. Mr. Speaker, the two nearest regional hospitals are Yarmouth and Bridgewater. Both are 100 kilometres away, and Queen's General Hospital is easily a 40-minute drive from different places in Shelburne. There is amazing care being provided at all of these hospitals. However, Shelburne County deserves to have ER doors open when they need it most. My question is, does the minister believe the people of Shelburne County are receiving adequate ER services? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as I've indicated uh, in my previous response, of course, uh, we uh, on, on this side, uh, as I believe the members uh, opposite, uh, recognize the concerns that uh, Nova Scotians have. And that's why we continue to work and invest in new recruitment and incentive programs. It's why we continue to work with our partners to improve our emergency uh, health services. Mr. Speaker, programs like the clerkship program that's taking off today provides opportunity for medical students to get exposure to rural uh, practice environments. That, Mr. Speaker, research shows has a higher probability of them choosing to practice there when they complete their training. Mr. Speaker, we know that having more people train as residents, they're more likely to stay and set up practice in this province. That, Mr. Speaker, is why we added 25 residency positions to the Housing Medical School, which are ongoing. So, Mr. Speaker, that's the type of stuff that we're doing to try to address the underlining fundamental issues for communities like uh, Shelburne and all across the province. The Honourable Member for Sydney River Myra Lewisburg. Pardon me, the Honourable Member for Argyle Barrington. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. La Fédération acadienne de la Nouvelle-Écosse a demandé en mai 2019 de rencontrer les trois caucus provinciaux pour discuter de leurs préoccupations à l'égard du rapport final sur la Commission euh, sur les frontières électorales. La FAN a rencontré notre caucus ainsi que celui des néo-démocrates. Cependant, après avoir demandé le caucus libéral à trois reprises et je déposerai les demandes, la FAN n'a pas été accordée l'occasion de rencontrer le caucus libéral ou même la ministre. Quand est-ce que la ministre prendra le temps pour rencontrer la femme, le porte-parole principal de la population acadienne et francophone de la Nouvelle-Écosse? The Honourable Minister of Acadian Affairs. Uh, merci, merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Félicitations à le nouveau membre. Uh, comme ministre des Affaires acadiennes et de la francophonie, je suis très contente uh, à vous répondre à cette question. Uh, Oh, well. Order, please. Time allotted for oral questions put by members of the ministers. 
has expired. We'll now move on to government business. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, that concludes the government's business for today. I move that the House now rise to meet again Tuesday, October 1, 2019, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Following the daily routine in QP, business will include second reading on Bills 152, the Plastic Bags Reduction Act, and Bill 160, an act to amend the Fisheries and Coastal Resources Act. And with time permitting, we will move to address and reply. The motion is for the House to adjourn to rise again Tuesday, October the 1st, uh, between the hours of 1 p.m. and 6 p.m. Would all those in favour of the motion please say aye. Contrary-minded, nay. The motion is carried. The House now stands adjourned until Tuesday, October the 1st at 1 p.m.